so let me uh, welcome you all to this 80th edition of thursday musings uh the today's topic is interplay of stress resilience and psychopathology uh, before we proceed further uh, tofan sir if you allow we can have a two minute silence for the for our senior psychiatrist departed soul dr paresh lakda wala yes yes let us have two minutes silence after two minutes we we'll proceed on with the formal proceedings please observe two minutes silence Uh, thank you everyone uh, can we proceed now sir yes the next slide please so let me hand over this session to the chairman of the program professor dr tufan pati uh, sir is from katak uh, he is very well known i am just handing over the session yes, to you yeah, tufan yeah, skip over the formal introduction sir over to you <clears throat> thank you alim and i welcome everyone to the 80th edition of first musings 20 sort of 100th edition and we have got with us two vibrant and quite well known quite amicable young leaders of ips dr alim siddiqui and dr amrit patrushi as our moderators both are professor of psychiatry and i take the privilege to directly go for the introduction of the honored chair persons next please dr amrit bodani is a private consultant in psychiatry from 1982 till today is a retired honorary psychiatrist he was in as in the capacity of honorary psychiatrist from 1983 to 2008 25 plus years in lg general hospital ahmedabad He is past president of Indian Psychiatric Society (GSP) branch. As his area of interest includes psychopharmacology and molecular biology of brain. But befitting the topic of today evening, welcome, Dr. Amrit Padari. And then we have with us Dr. Mahesh Gowda, his DPM Psychiatry and DNB. His present affiliation is his managing director, Department of Psychiatry, Spandan Healthcare, Bangalore. coordinates the dnb program of spandana nursing home significantly has been instrumental in the successful launch and smooth running of the much needed rehabilitation services his area of research interest include general adult psychiatry rehab and addiction special interest dr gowda has made noteworthy contribution towards organizing conferences and various research and academic activities major awards and achievements DLN Murthy Rao Award for Best Outgoing Student at the National Institute of Mental Health and Sciences, Mumbai. Dr. Gowda is keenly involved in community activities and has made several media appearances on TV channels, participating in panel discussions and public awareness programs on mental health. His research and publications. Dr. Mahesh has published various articles in peer-reviewed national and international journals. Welcome, Dr. Mahesh Gowda. Welcome, Dr. Amrit Bodani. From this moment onwards. the proceedings of this evening are yours 
please proceed. Good evening, everybody. Has Dr. Baskar joined? I guess so, Baskar Mukherjee. Yeah. Uh, please, may Baskar is co-host. Baskar, unmute yourself. Yes, I have joined. Yeah. yeah. Welcome, Baskar. Uh, just let me see why the video is not playing. It should not be like this. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now everything is sorted. Hmm. Thank you, Chairpersons. You may proceed now. Hmm. <sighs> Dr. Amrit sir, for introduction of Dr. Baskar. Dr. Bodani, please introduce Dr. Baskar. No need. Uh, uh, okay, I'll start. Good evening, friends. It's my pleasure to chair today's session. Thanks to Alim Bhai, Ofan Pati, and Amrit Bhai for inviting me. I am assigned the job of introducing Baskar. The very easy job and the very difficult at the same time. Easy because last Thursday, Dr. Bijal had already introduced him and very lucidly told his details about his creativity, his uh, intelligence, his uh, passion and all the things. So today I take this opportunity to say something about Bhaskar, which I perceive in him and my relationship with him. So today's uh, description will not be about his academics or about his performance, but what I perceive him as a person, as a psychiatrist, as a scientist, as a human being. Mm. I know Bhaskar since four years through live CME. My staying with him at various places during his visit to Gujarat during national conferences and my personal discussion with him on WhatsApp, most of the time discussing various cases, my personal problem, my own uh, COVID suffering, and he helped me a lot during those, uh, those that period. He gave me courage as well as guidance that how should I proceed. So this was the encounter which I cannot forget. Few days back, someone in the live CME said, Bhaskar as a big fish. And instantly, one word came to my mind, that was whale shark. And I wrote down that also. Why whale shark? Because uh, whale shark is supposed to be a giant, silent giant, a gentle giant of the sea. And I perceive Bhaskar is one of the person who is giant as far as psychiatry is concerned and is gentle also, but as happens, he is ruthless also in, on many aspects as far as uh, destroying the old psychology, psychosocial sciences and uh, humanities and all yoga and meditation and all these things which uh, we have been or many are being advocating since two centuries. So he has been ruthless in that, and maybe he has invited a lot of dislikes from many stalwarts, many seniors, and many so-called politically correct people. So this, but he doesn't care about it. 
he is that way bold enough courageous enough to proceed on his path of searching psychiatry through brain and this is a beautiful thing which i always appreciate there was some baskar 50% baskar in me which is now awakened by him in himself so i think uh, now i also feel somewhere that i have become half of the baskar of course not of the his level about 3 years back during lucknow conference i asked uh, i told him he is a genius which he disliked very badly since then i have been feeling that i should replace that word genius because he doesn't like it with the word brilliance so i i think he is the brilliant person who can see psychiatry through brain through genes through molecular biology and through every from microscope to macroscopic view of psychiatry and he calls the psychiatry is my baby as if he loves him like a child so he doesn't allow anybody to touch the child from any other angle other than the brain science what he calls biological approach so i think uh, this this approach of psychiatry i think is the future of psychiatry and he will take us long way and uh, to the new frontiers of the psychiatry to understand us not only psychiatry pharmacotherapy and to have the courage enough to give appropriate adequate doses i think i learned from him few drugs which i never used in my life and they were uh, melatonin then i used to give lot of uh, propranolol which i had now developed a very good uh, nick to use in a higher dose because of his uh, suggestion and i have been using uh, i was fond of benzodiazepine which was condemned by many psychiatrists but still i am fond of it but i use now it more uh, frequently than before so these are few things which i have learned from it and i have always look forward for him for any guidance any suggestion and i am almost always in constant touch with him not only for my own problems which i have been experimenting on myself i am taking melatonin and donepezil since last 11 months i he is treating my grandson for autism so i am taking his help and he has been very much useful guide and a colleague of course a junior to me but i think as far as knowledge and uh, other things are concerned except in experience i he is ahead of me thank you uh, thank you dr amrit badani uh, for setting up the stage and introducing the today's resource person uh, today we have a very interesting topic uh, where uh dr baskar is going to talk about the fine interplay of stress resilience and uh, psychopathology we all have been witness to natural disasters a lot more can be technological we have seen the pandemic a lot of things can be terror and also political in nature we have seen uh, the definition of re resilience evolving all the time and as the name resilience suggests it's been dynamic it's been adaptive and always evolving and uh, there are various models in which resilience has actually been viewed right from the time uh, we talked about developmental models now we have actually at a stage where it is multi systemic in approach and uh, we definitely have evolved to a stage where you are saying this is resilient science so how uh, one's resilience really matters how does one uh, at one spectrum have an adaptive response and other end have a maladaptive response leads leading to psychopathology is what is going to be explained today and uh, who better than baskar who knows uh, so much of the details that dr amrit badani talked about is uh, is going to be the best job and dr uh, baskar is going to talk about uh, the fine interplay between stress resilience and psychopathology today over to dr baskar thank you mm. don't press to me too much i feel really uncomfortable uncomfortable i don't think that jhoot kya i don't like uh, praise i don't like it i don't like it at all it makes something which i hate i don't want to be an icon i am a myself i am the iconoclast and 
the biggest disservice you can do to a rebel or iconoclast is to make him icon, him or her icon. So no, no, no. Please don't praise me too much. So we this thing. Let's first recap what we have talked yesterday. Yesterday we talked about our brains, various processes through which it controls the homeostasis and how the molecular level at, at molecular level homeostasis is grossly controlled this is these are the flow charts which i made to make people understand it now i lied about one thing that this is the gross thing and i am not going to go beyond that that is the lie i have fed you in last seminar because i don't i never wanted my audience to become anxious that aur kya bolega ab kya bolne wala hai nahi so today we are going to delve deep in the real pathologies of brain and how they evolve from homeostatic disturbances and the process of maintenance of homeostasis which is known as resilience the much abused abused word in psychiatry so our last basker can you go on full yeah. screen mode please yes uh screen mode nahi ho raha hai i am sharing the screen am i not sharing a uh, slide share mode it should be full screen your screen is shared your slides are not full screen yes i would go to that once Achha. i start today's presentation okay at present we are now recapping the previous one so this was the last side where i talked about the genetic the real psychiatric diseases which are hiding in the brain and they are the genetic group of diseases which cause homeostatic disturbances and cause stress response system malfunction and ultimately destabilization and destruction of resilience leading to disease which is multi systemic in nature and starts from brain so now today we would go in the detail so what happens when one or multiple of these subgroups of genetic mutations affect brain are they getting in progress hmm. yes so whenever there is disturbances in the stress response system due to presence of these genetic causes there would be exaggerated stress response system of brain and there would be resulting dysfunction symptom that dysfunction symptoms we can divide or we can actually describe in cognitive dysfunction symptom about which neither psychiatrist nor neurologist were interested till a few years ago emotional dysfunction symptom which psychiatrist own for themselves motor dysfunction symptom which neurologist took over sensory dysfunction symptoms which again neurologist took over behavioral dysfunction symptom which psychiatrist took for themselves and visceral dysfunction symptoms which each specialty dealing with that viscera is owning up so brain any dysfunction of brain is 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 layer of expression and each of them cannot be differentiated let's say brain has been affected by a autoimmune process then 
there would be cognitive dysfunction there would be emotional dysfunction there would be motor dysfunction there would be sensory dysfunction there would be behavioral dysfunction and there would be visceral dysfunction we cannot give some to neurology some to psychiatry some to cardiology some to nephrology some to gastroenterology but that is what what has been happening in today's medical system and by doing that we are doing a very huge disservice to brain and psychiatry because all of these are actually domain of psychiatry or psychiatry neurology combination discipline anyway let's go to the real symptoms and i can promise you one thing once today's lecture is over you would get a gross framework for understanding how each psychiatric symptom evolve so let's navigate the turbulent sea of real psychiatric symptoms also known as the pathophysiological responses of stress response system the we would start with the fast universal responses and then would progress to tricky ones the fast universal response is always exaggerated or prolonged illness behavior this is not illness behavior of so called psychology this is illness illness behavior of developmental neuroscience or you can say developmental biology every animal shows a typical illness behavior when it is hurt or it is we are talking about that illness behavior initial and how that would evolve initially there would be cellular hyperactivity in brain but here one or more of the steps that connects this cellular hyperactivity to neural cell activation division and division is defective so ultimate process of new synapse formation increase in new cell formation increase in cerebral functionality would be delayed and slow and most of the time it would be inadequate so brain would not be able to and handle the homeostatic load in these conditions and this would start the cascade of dysfunctional manifestation this dysfunctional symptom will manifest with hyperactivity of the system through which brain controls itself and body because when brain is hyperactive the downstream system would become hyperactive and those downstream system through which brain controls body would cause all the manifestation in brain as well as in the rest of the body so this would be dysfunction of the formative components of allostasis allostasis the so called allostasis we described earlier so it would be autonomic nervous system symptom it would be neuroendocrine system symptoms it would be immune and coagulation system symptoms it would be regulatory nervous system symptoms at cortical level subcortical level spinal level and peripheral nervous system level so fast autonomic nervous system symptoms what can we expect this is a picture of autonomic nervous system you can see it controls various brain nuclei to various facial structure to lungs heart liver pancreas whole gi system whole genitourinary system including kidney and all the various salivary gland as well as other secretory glands body so what would happen to each of the organ in lungs there would be increased respiratory rate there would be bronchoconstriction and increase mucus production followed by increase in tidal volume and decreased decrease in vital capacity so ultimately there would be hyperventilation shallow rapid breathing 
and there would be mouth breathing because for rapid conduction of air nasal or paranasal sinuses are not enough the person has to go to fast lip breathing to maintain this rapid air flow so there would be mouth respiration respiration to mouth this would result in dryness of mouth and dryness of pharynx in cardiovascular system there would be increased inotropic response increased chronotropic response so cardiac output as well as heart rate both would increase at first now cardiac output increase would lead to two events one is baroreceptor activation another one is afterload increase afterload now increase afterload would cause construction of peripheral resistance arterial specifically in peripheral in the peripheral circulation or limb circulation so blood would be diverted from limb circulation to central circulation this would result in decreased skin temperature cold extremities as well as this would be resulting in increase central uh, uh, blood and there would be chances of various baroreceptor receptor reflex activation some of them might lead to various kind of neurocardiogenic syncope now in the renal system the renal blood flow would increase the gfr would increase there would be increase filtration resulting in increase in increase urinary blood bladder urine also there would be increased contraction of pale trigon muscle resulting in increased urination there would be gi symptoms in form of upper gi stasis upper gi chances of reverse peristalsis and nausea upper gi poor digestion but increase in lower gi motility and diarrhea so we are getting a person who is, who is showing signs of tachycardia dryness of mouth who is showing cold extremities who is showing increased frequency of urination who is showing nausea at times vomiting indigestion and diarrhea now brain symptoms would be hyper vigilance as well as rest restlessness in cognitive area there would be hyper vigilance as well as there would be various forms of decision making errors in sensory area there would be hyper acute sensory perception as well as in sensory area there will be increased perception of all sensory motility in motor area there will be restlessness in behavioral area there will be irritability as well as there will be loss of concentration and in visceral symptom i have already described so along with that i also forgot to mention the skin symptoms the sweat glands would be hyperactive and also there will be hyperproduction of sebum resulting in oily skin the high uh, the excessive sweat production would be limited to all flexor surface 
all, means all body creases. Along with that, in those areas which are situated very close to, yes, someone raised their hand. I think Bhaskar, we can continue. We are going quite good. Hmm. We'll take yes. questions from the end. Okay, okay. Probably we will not be able to take question today. Anyway, uh, today I promise you, you that you would be overloaded. Uh, and there would be ultimately cold and clammy extremities. So now neuroendocrine system dysfunction. At hypothalamic level, at pituitary level, adrenal level, gonadal level, GI endocrine level. At hypothalamic level, all hypothalamic hormones would increase. And the hormones which would increase the hypothalamic releasing hormone or which would inhibit the hypothalamic releasing hormone, they, their tone would also increase. At pituitary level, all anterior pituitary hormones would increase as well as the posterior pituitary hormones would also increase, but they are in a sense hypothalamic hormones. At adrenal gland level, sex steroid would increase and all other medullary hormones would increase. At gonadal level, there would be various disturbance and various changes in feedback. Now, I would be more focused on gonadal level because this would give you an important understanding of a, of a neglected phenomena that we see in our patient. This is a sample gonadal feedback circuit. It is in male, what I am showing in male, but it's almost same thing happens in female. There is pulsatile GNI release from arcuate and kiss neurons, arcuate nucleus kiss neurons. The, there are suprahypothalamic control. At pituitary level, there are multiple facilitating as well as inhibiting feedback loop. Uh, in this slide, act, the activate, activating, inhibiting, facilitating circuit is not there, but it is also there. Now, at the level of testes, or in case of female, there is ovary, there are also a lot of feedback loops maintaining. This causes normal sexual function and normal cyclic menstruation in female. Now, these are the hypothalamic neuropeptides which affects this cycle. Amongst these, Is peptin. We know you know most of this, so I am not really interested in uh, elaborating those because most of the psychiatrists know orexin, hypocaine, ghrelin, neuropeptide Y, and their effect and other things. But I would just say that orexin, ghrelin, neuropeptide Y, MCH, CCK. All of these hmm, all of these have their level changes in when the brain is undergoing through destabilization of homeostatic control. And so they interfere with normal gonadal circuit action. Now, what I would be more interested in gonadal inhibitory hormone, that is GNIH, the number 11 one. His peptin is also important, but perhaps that would be overload. So GNIH, actually it's a group of hormone which is situated in the brainstem. They connect to hypothalamic or exogenic neurons, PUMC neurons, 
they are activated by various metabolic condition as well as they are activated by so called changes in homeostatic parameters as well as changes in various acth loop is it uh, hypothalamic pituitary uh, axis as well as hypothalamic adrenal axis and ultimately they causes inhibition of gnrh neuron and they ultimately change the reproductive behavior why i am talking so much about this thing because when there is destabilization of homeostatic control there would be just a minute i have to just one minute just a minute whenever there is destabilization of homeostatic control there would be disturbances of this cyclic ovulation and cyclic menstrual cycle of woman first there would be an ovulatory cycle this an ovulatory cycle would cause the unerupted ovum to stay as follicular cyst so they would have change in their cycle length and ovulatory cycle, uh, cycle and also follicular cysts in both ovary this would lead to a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome but in early stage when solely brain is responsible these people would not have muscularization feature these people would not have any kind of increase in prolactin beyond normal or increase in anti mullerian hormone beyond normal but when this thing progresses and involves other hormonal circuits mean adrenal cortex circuit and sex steroid feedback loop is in, uh, disturbed as well as the adipocyte should be the globe is disturbed then the other changes occurs and ultimately we would get fully formed muscularizing features as well as increased antimullerian factor as well as increased prolactin how long it takes from the only brain involved stage to brain and ovary involved stage we don't but this is one thing we have to remember that tcod starts in brain and this whole process is actually part of it now there would be immune system and coagulation system symptom there would be allergic symptom there would be hypercoagulability there would be various other immune systems like localized and systemic autoimmunity now there would be regulatory nervous system dysfunction syndrome i have described cortical symptoms already in subcortical area there would be disturbances in fine motor movement there would be disturbances in motor and emotional planning there would be disturbances in emotional values as well as motor value based judgment system at spinal level there would be increase in muscle tone because the neuromuscular junction would actually be hyperactive now which muscles would be more which muscles would be more uh, more affected it would be those muscles which are constantly active in our body now the posture maintaining muscles means the muscles which maintain the bipedal structure of ours 
are the most active muscles of our body so they would go into frequent spasm and we would have the person would have pain in neck low back ache and pain and spasm in legs at peripheral nervous system level there will be various sensory disturbances like tingling and numbness and other things so what we call these symptoms together in this patient anxiety and depression and various forms depending on what symptoms predominate so you see anxiety and depression are universal fast dysfunction syndrome of brains homeostatic disturbance they are the first one they are the universal one anything and everything that affects brain and reduces brain functionality would cause appearance of anxiety and depression symptom and along with phobia depending on what and which causes hypervigilance trigger in this people i hope i have given you far idea of the fast easily configurable thing because yes. this this is easy this is the easy one now we would going to the difficult part so the fast difficult part the lifelong genetic trait which is there when there is genetic defect of any or many of this pathway which cause this periodic anxiety and depression symptom how it would present there will be hyper vigilant constant hyper vigilance there would be excessive rumination there will be periodic anhedonia there will be tendency to stick to fix routine and rituals to avoid sudden changes because any sudden change would not be able to be processed by brain and would cause information overload to brain so brain would always avoid to go into those sudden changes and these people would be stickler to routine they would always maintain various rules they would not break any rules they would not take any chance they would not do anything rash they would be highly perfectionist to avoid sudden destabilization and stress the so called obsessive compulsive personality is actually the prototype of it obsessive compulsive personality trait is actually also the most common trait associated with all psychiatric and neurological diseases the uh, neurological diseases are so called diseases because now we can understand none of these are diseases these are just symptom if you see parkinsonian personality trait you would find out that parkinsonian personality trait is nothing but obsessive compulsive personality trait if you see neurodegenerative personality trait parkinsonian personality trait is actually a very hotly researched topic in neurology if you go into the neurology journal the journal named neurology you would find talk about parkinsonian personality trait in every alternate edition anyway there would also be pers- uh, uh, neurodegenerative personality trait there would also be various kind of psychiatric personality trait depressive personality trait all of these are various spectrum of the same obsessive compulsive personality trait and when they start increasing gradually they become our obsessive compulsive symptom or ocd whatever way you call it and that is why you need to give the final response dose as long as you can give because in so called depression or so called anxiety we are treating a patient who has acute destabilization but their background system is capable of restoring back to 
where it was before the sudden destabilization. It was destabilized, but in a chronic destabilization. When we are treating OCD, we are managing a deteriorating system, a system which is destabilizing completely. And so the drug dose would always be high and we should always maintain that drug level which caused the patient to go into remission. This is another long-standing question that has come came to many exams, but there was no actual biological explanation for it. This stress resilience, stress response system, and homeostatic balance, if we think clearly, would give answer to this two. Now the other brain condition. And actually, now we are going into proverbial Bermuda angle of psychiatry because we are be talking about major psychosis. Yes, I am deeply against this schizophrenia, bipolar, and these things because they are just dogmatic stand by American Psychiatric Association and who? Because DSM and ICD are nothing but some dogmatic rule system. As I told you, this is again those charts where I promised that I would not go into it, but we would go into it. So we, I told that whenever there is increased homeostatic load and high information resulting in high informational kinetic load, there would be hyperactivity of brain areas handling the load. There would be increased mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. There would be increased rate of stress and cellular stress resulting in cellular stress sensing by NLR and resultant DMP pathway activation. There would also be cellular protein recycling, high number of cellular recycling and ER stress. This would be the pathological form of that. This is a cell where it is activated by DMP pathway, damage activated molecular pathway or pathogen associated molecular pathway, mitochondrial DNA oxidative state, oxidated lipids, various reactive oxygen species, uric acid, ATP, a lot of things, cytokines, chemokines, they would actually activate this cell and there would be formation of not like receptor 3 inflammation. This inflammation would actually amplify this excitation. There would be actually formation of various chemokine. There would also be various transcriptomic changes in the nucleus and would produce various cytokines or chemokines resulting in amplification of infection uh, inflammation. There would also be mitochondrial disturbances which would be triggered by and which would trigger various glutamate pathway disturbances and ATP hydrolysis and other thing. Ultimately, the rest, it would cause activation of resting microglia and this would cause cellular rate, overactive microglia, T cell mediated, various immune amplification, T regulatory system would be impaired, the resting state microglia would not be there much and the M2, this blue is M2 form, red is M1 form. M1 form of microglia would predominate and ultimately there would be a micro step amplification of the whole thing. It would happen when there is hyperactivation of brain cells and the brain cells are causing uncoordinated immune activation, which would not be suppressed by the immunosuppressive part of immune system. So there is immune 
amplification which would go in a snow a snow storm story avalanche manner and there would be magnific tremendous magnification which would result in eccentricity of shape and as i talked about neurovascular coupling there would be destruction of neurovascular coupling too the astrocyte in plate would cause pericyte to get more active there would be loosening of this tight junctions and these various factor would be secreted inside the cells inside from the astrocyte in uh, uh, in feet to pericyte and through pericyte to blood vessel this will result in huge propagation of vasoaptic peptide along with there would be activation of microglia activation of presynaptic neuron and this depolarization and ultimately this neurovascular coupling would result in a widespread spreading vascular dilatation number 1 number 2 neural tail simulation followed by cortical depression and along with that chronic excitotoxicity this would result in pain in the trigeminovascular system and we would call that headache as migraine headache so this is how migraines originate now glial cell can be activated by all of these things i am not going into details i have i know i have studied confusing you so whenever there is microglial activation this microglial activation cause damage to various key neuronal substrate there would be disturbances in synapses the synaptic number would go low there would be various forms of dendritic pruning there would be imperfect myelination there would be migration disturbances of the cells and they would come into a deranged connection so we would get first a picture of a person who is doing things repeatedly because of that underlying obsessive compulsive trait now these people amongst those obsessive compulsive traits some of the, some people would have impaired immune activation trait and they would go into hyper immune activation followed by my cortical spreading uh, inflammation vascular vasodilation and ultimately cortical spreading depression resulting in migraine some of them would go further and their brain would start showing various disconnection syndrome various excitotoxicity resulting in chronic anxiety chronic low mood as well as periodic hyperactivation and periodic excitability we would call this as activation state as mania and the low stages as depression and we would create a picture of bipolar disorder now this again those active state or those in hyper inflammatory state initially would not result in much cellular loss but as it progress there would be various forms of neuronal destruction there would be changes in early stage means developing cns there would be changes in later stage and uh, ultimately adult stage or ages each of these would cause successive dysfunction of microglia and impaired microglial function followed by successive disturbed immune activation 
disturb cellular connection and would result in a group of people who would have this obsessive compulsive feature these periodic anxiety and depression feature along with periodic brain activation and also a chronic cognitive deficit chronic deficit in various functional area we tend to call this thing these people as schizophrenic so this is chronic psychosis this is the picture we see microglia how microglia disturbances how glial progenitor disturbances how chronic immune disturbances are causing all those so this is what i end today and i ask you people whether you have understood or not or have i made you too bored and too tired hello you want to end the presentation here or psychotropic bhi thoda bataoge साइबोट्रॉपिक मैं बताऊंगा लेकिन पहले मैं थोड़ा ये पूछ लू कि कुछ ज्यादा तो नहीं हो गया ओके सो वील इनवाइट अ फ्यू क्वेश्चंस एनी क्लैरिफिकेशन स्टिल नाउ देन वी वुड प्रोसीड अगेन लोग भाग रहे हैं मैंने ज्यादा बोल दिया एनी एनी क्वेरीज तरुणदीप सुष्मिता दोनों ने ही क्वेरी किया तो फिर सुष्मिता आई हैव अनम्यूटेड सुष्मिता प्लीज अनम्यूट यस सर आई वाज वंडरिंग कि व्हाई ब्रेन इज रिएक्टिंग लाइक दैट वे uh suppose uh, when uh, see uh, i have some blood loss or my body is in shock mm. so the major mm. uh, organ of the body like kidney uh, brain mm. uh, then uh, liver so who needs uh, extra blood supply there will be splanchnic vesicle and this thing will happen and they will work in a way that uh, like adaptive response but mm. why brain is uh, reacting like that if there is anything is there brain is troubling itself and along with that it's troubling all other organ and why it is giving pain to it also because hello and hello, also hello. to the whole you, way brain is uh, hmm. working like that when because brain is the master organ of body so whenever there is a change in parameter of body brain has to readjust the whole body brain cannot leave any change alone so whenever there is blood loss the uh, diversion of blood from various capacitors vessels means large veins splanchnic circulation to other parts of body would be decided by brain and autonomic nervous system after that if the problem if the problem persists or that diversion would not create a new homeostatic balance then brain would start going in a snowballing manner first the homeostatic balance to restore i, I am giving the blood loss uh, only the blood loss okay the blood, uh, a person has lost a lot of blood and the brain is adjusting to that first it would divert blood from splanchnic blood vessel to sent system circulation it would divert blood from venous capacitance vessel to central circulation if that makes it okay well enough if that doesn't make it okay then brain would try to reduce the after load so that heart doesn't go into problem hmm. okay Uh, no 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 i am not complete just let okay. me complete uh, so 
uh, the brain would start to actually i am getting distracted by lot of questions so that's why i got uh, at times don't look at the chat box here ha huh. yeah so what would happen is brain would try to dilate the afra load uh, resist resistance vessels so that uh, body doesn't get starved of oxygen and heart doesn't feel too much pressure but from here the downhill course would start because by dilating the resistance vessel Uh, brain is actually reducing the total bl uh, blood flow so there would be peripheral hypoxia followed by peripheral vascular damage and vascular leakage ultimately there would be formation of a damage associated molecular pathway associated systemic shock syndrome and ultimately multiple organ dysfunction and patient will die if brain cannot control so you see blood loss trigger it but if the trigger cannot be balanced brain would try again and again in various way and ultimately those balancing act many times kill to patient for example in covid covid doesn't kill uh, never kills a one it is brain and it is inappropriate immune activation which kills a patient okay now turn the टली it is a it, it is all a feedback loop when one feedback loop falls another feedback loop comes into operation and it goes on till a new homeostatic balance is reached so, uh, as long as the balance is not reached brain would go on trying and ultimately that try would kill us sir another question uh, sir initially you described that uh, in six domains there may be symptoms so uh, yeah. sensory system this thing the there and mm. some domains uh, we psychiatrists are taking care of some domain are taking care of mm. by taking care by uh, neurologists some by all other specialists so sir mm. how uh, it like other domain how they will come to decide that it is that is due to the brain thing because how can we predict a person that he will he is showing this symptoms because of that like uh, uh, if, mm. yes, uh, yes that yes, is yes. Uh, sir actually i am giving you example gastroenterologists have started a stream known as neurogastroenterology because they have found out that there is no local gi pathology in a lot of patients of gastroenterology and they have diverted those patients into neurogastroenterology neurogastroenterology is nothing but brain interfering with gi system now cardiologist has created a stream known as behavioral cardiology it includes all the patients of cardiac symptom where no local cardiac defect has been found or there has been local cardiac defect but that is not able to explain the system wise disturbances that is faced by or all, all the patient similarly the people are talking about behavioral uh, uh, nephrology people are talking about uh, behavioral pulmonology so each of these streams are finding their brain patients and they are segregating them into their own subgroup so yes that can be found so so our subject is being taken up by other uh, subjects so like we yes. should be the specialist in this thing na like see uh, sir if a person Sushmita, is... if we talk about this thing then i think we should let other people also talk suspita yes yes this avish bhai yeah hello this is some... good evening sir yeah. 
हेलो सर दिस इज भवेश भाई ये ये कई बुक से नहीं मैं नहीं रीडिंग पढ़ रहा हूं सो देयर इज नो नेम ऑफ दिस बुक इफ यू वांट टू नो व्हाट इज द नेम ऑफ द बुक देन वेट फॉर एट लीस्ट फाइव टू सिक्स इयर्स लेट मी राइट इट फाइव टू सिक्स यस so you so have can i ask the question sorry hello yes then turn it hello sir good evening yes uh, thank thank you for presenting sir uh, very insightful and uh, as usual so sir i want to ha- i want to ask four things which i'll ask together hmm uh, for- first thing is that can we also explain glucose intolerance or hypertension this way that's number one yes and- uh, no 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 let me answer you one by one yes glucose intolerance or impaired uh, the right word is impaired glucose tolerance igt is part brain part adipose tissue part uh, various other endocrine organ so yes igt can be explained this way so is hypertension so is in fact frank diabetes frank diabetes and its complication are many at times and man many an areas determined by brain so so sir does that imply talking a bit more uh, with a hmm. like contrarian view that does that mean that high dose ssri can treat pcod or glucose intolerance uh this is something that would be very interesting to try let me give you my personal experience because this is one thing that you would not find in any research manual or any research paper or in any anything only uh, various practitioners if they open up they would be able to give you their experience i am sharing my experience in my practice i see roughly uh 1500 to 1700 patients per month now amongst these patients i have seen a substantial group of patient who had previous diabetes previous hypertension have had to reduce their anti diabetic drug or anti hypertensive drug after getting adequate dose treatment from me this is one evidence i have in case of pcod my experience is not so clear in pcod i have seen that their endocrine profile gets slightly better they perform slightly better their risk uh, uh, rate of menstrual disturbances slightly better but the problem is there is no reversal like either hypertension or diabetes so this is my accumulated data from my practice i would say as i always say single person observation doesn't hold much value we need other people to step in and share their experience and if possible form a collaborative group publication only then we can say this with confidence till then it is just a single practitioner experience which some other practitioners said but there is no research publication on this okay. now say your third question yeah sir just to contradict your view and your hypothesis i'm sorry but uh, please just listen that why not if we go, if go, we go through uh, challenge me i would be happy sir if we are going through the homeostatic model as per your uh, study and research then no then not the homeostasis uh, up to homeostasis is not my own study or research 
no, the no. explanation but, the explanation is mine but yeah so, the everything yeah. else is there sure so sir what i'm trying to say is that if uh, let's say that a poor homeostasis is leading to a consortium of symptoms then mm. perhaps a person should have more resilience or a better homeostasis management when the person is young or, or in a better body but then why do all of these symptoms or illnesses or whatever you may like to call they emerge more in young adulthood and not in the middle age or in the late late age also uh, I, when we give hmm. side effects, oh, also, no no, okay, no 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 let me and and uh, yeah because this is third question i let me answer the third question then we will come to fourth okay 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 so, okay. so your question is why the uh, if homeostatic function is the cause then why patients are coming into young age because uh, according to your understanding homeostasis is better functioning in young age not really not at all it is a genetic process homeostatic maintenance or stress response whatever name you call it it is a genetic response with epigenetic benefits modification now a genetic response would depend on collective genetic load on that genetic system collective genetic load means how much dysfunctional genes are there and how much protective genes are there that total balance is known as genetic load now in those persons who have high genetic load then they would have a earlier chance of dysfunction this is number 1 that is why in those patients who present early they have higher genetic load higher genetic burden number 2 and more interestingly is our body has circadian clock seasonal clock and number 3 life cycle clock now life cycle clock is very interesting it's a molecular mechanism which determines which set of genes would be expressed more to for protein synthesis during which stage of life some genes are active during childhood some are during adult stage some are during old stage now there are two bridge period one is when childhood is trans uh, uh, actually getting transferred to adulthood the adolescent stage and the second one is when adulthood is transferred into old age the middle age these two periods are heavily gene change type in this time a lot of genes of our body changes their function some would become deformed defunct some would become more functional some would become less functional and things like that if you notice all non communicable diseases increase in adolescence and in middle age let's say cancer by modal peak Uh, in hodgkins disease it is purely known as bimodal peak in other the bimodal peak is not always discussed but it is always there in, in diabetes bimodal peak in hypertension bimodal peak in all psychiatric symptom it is bimodal peak so your point is not actually contradicting homeostasis or contradicting stress response your point is just due to not understanding of the whole genetic regulation of body processes now your fourth question thank you sir i'm sorry i'm mindful of others others interest also but i'll quickly ask it that uh, mm. so according to this point that you raised that all obsessive compulsive personality traits actually end up mm. as parkinsonian traits so but oh, not is, all not all no 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 not okay. all okay uh, obsessive compulsive personality trait is a pan phenomena pan phenomena means any kind of non communicable disease 
present from birth with obsessive compulsive personality trait the brain is for example let's say we get a person who is destined to develop multiple malignancies in their future life they would develop they would have obsessive compulsive personality trait along with something else depending on their specific gene formation all person who would who are destined to develop neurodegenerative disease be it parkinsonism be it dementia would have obsessive compulsive personality trait along with something else which is characteristics towards their own specific genetic defect all non communicable disease person would have obsessive compulsive trait so it is not purely parkinsonian personality but neurologists love to describe this as parkinsonian personality if you search in net by the name of parkinsonian personality you would come up with lots of paper so i gave name of uh, the parkinsonian personality a special mention but it is neither meant that all obsessive compulsive personality trait would end up in parkinsonism or all parkinsonian personality patient are only ocpd okay. okay so so sir my question here was actually i didn't complete it so so oc spectrum is also related to autism spectrum and uh, eating disorders and ocd mm. so is all of that also a part of this uh, spectrum itself and that was the fourth mm. question mm. and mm. the fifth fourth question, question I'll, i'll just i actually uh, missed your fourth question because ali man has actually sent a message uh, so uh, what would be your fourth question please again remind me sir so the question was that you mentioned that oc traits can also present as parkinson so my question was that oc trait is also overlapping uh, also with autism spectrum and other conditions hmm, everything so Ev- everything autism spectrum hmm autism yeah. is not a disease it's again a symptom okay so okay. Uh, yes it is it would always overlap with autism spectrum in fact a autism spectrum symptom if we see in a developmental way child developmental way autism spectrum symptom are forerunners of oc spectrum yes. but again that would go uh, that would make us go into child psychiatry and people would be just mere naam ka supari de denge child psychiatrist logo abhi nahi jana hai hmm so but uh, uh, bmt has a, a raised his hand please unmute yourself please unmute and ask hello yes 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 yeah my my question is uh, uh, if a person who has been suffering suffering with from anxiety or depression mm. <clears throat> and mm. after a period of lifetime of some experience he improves is it because mm. of genetic factors alone or environment also plays a role environment means here there is actually what would happen let's say some person has a genetic defect which would result in his or her brain not functioning optimally and this person would develop anxiety and the depression symptom but as the person's life progresses this person having a good genetic basis of learning and having a good understanding of various environmental triggers are able to avoid the environmental triggers are able to learn which things trigger them and which things are actually beneficial for them then there is a chance that due to these two combined factors their 
chances of getting trigger would be less and their symptomatology would become more stable so here the learning genetics and some environmental factors do play a role genetics is vulnerability genetics genetics is resilience genetics genetics is also learning genetics here their learning genetics as well as their environmental input has made a difference in their life uh other baskar baskar i think we should hurriedly go through the psychotropics and then no i am not planning to go to psychotropic actually i was waiting for that response can i ask one last bad. question can i ask one last question no last question i know a lot of people are reaching to ask questions so i would ask everyone clear your doubts anyone who wants lim you first clear your doubts <laughs> what are the other traits other than the oc traits oh uh, there would be compulsive impulsive trait which i always talk about compulsive impulsive trait is just a bifurcation of obsessive compulsive trait what happens is these persons have hyper vigilance these persons have ruminating tendency but their prefrontal control or frontal control or neocortical control whatever we call is not well developed so they frequently misjudge they act on various impulses and their motivational control is not at all great so they would develop obsessive trait compulsive trait along with impulsive trait along with various aggressive trait and we would classify some of them into addictive personality some of them into uh, so called antisocial personality some of them would go into borderline personality provided they are pain and pleasures areas are sufficiently closely linked and along with them I, we would also term them histrionic and other thing these are hmm. yeah. yes chitesh asked chitesh shrivastav that uh, these oc traits they could also be a source of uh, strength in high achievers yes. so take yeah, on exactly this. exactly uh, i am talking about traits traits are neither good nor bad compulsive impulsive trait if a manager if a sales person gets this compulsive impulsive trait the uh, uh, sales person would be able to sell feed to eskimo they would be such a smooth talker and such a accomplished uh, manipulator now similarly this obsessive trait they would help the person to go to peak of their professional life because these people would be dependable these people would have a uh, traits which make them perfectly suited for any responsible job so traits are traits they are just like height weight other thing so they are there they give us some vulnerability some strength problem is that the vulnerability that we get is exaggerated normal response to various environmental or external environmental or internal environmental destabilization and that let these people be labeled as depressive sometimes uh, anxiety prone sometimes other thing this is just a trade off just as i am 6 feet 6 inches tall that means indian railway normal coach is not suited for me whenever i go into uh, railway uh, uh, one night journey uh, half of my leg is out of bunk and people either uh, uh, actually beat my leg or they get stumble on my leg similarly i cannot ride in any buses or at other public vehicle but again due to this height i am easily noticeable i can reach higher spaces easily so just like high height 
just like low height these are normative trait but exaggerated normative trait can give us various advantages and disadvantages Bhaskar, what i want to know is one thing you have talked with oc traits it is in the classical sense that we have even thought about hmm. so what are the other traits jo, the other personality traits dimensions hai, are they not important or are they derivative of this oc only they, they are derivative of oc personality trait and compulsive impulsive personality trait these two are stable personality traits baki sab they are various combinations of this so suppose a dissocial dissocial trait Our uh, dissocial trait is predominantly compulsive impulsive trait along with obsessive trait. Obsessive trait उसका हो ज़्यादा भी हो सकता है कम भी हो सकता है. Compulsive impulsive trait उसका ज़्यादा होगा. Okay, okay. Our narcissistic our narcissistic uh. personality trait. Narcissistic personality trait is some obsessive person in whose life. most of the decisions are correct that person would become insufferably controlling insufferably arrogant and insufferable believer of his own, his or her own self worth and we would get narcissistic person so then schizoid schizoid is those obsessive as well as those obsessive compulsive personality who has very low self worth who has very low and rather needles uh social exposure and they are they are fearful of society so they avoid social stimulation all together they are for they are very fearful and so they prefer to stay in their own cell and we make them a suicide person So, if first hurdle is crossed, we might land up into anxiety and depression, and when hmm. it, when it gets more severe, land then I, major psychosis. Hmm. Major psychosis that might be initially that might be uh, like mania, later that might be psychosis, and they would alter it. These and major then, then, major major psychosis idea was very good idea. Uh, this they are differentiated into schizophrenia and bipolar has created a lot of trouble. And and later on, it will land up into uh, cognitive uh, loss-like picture in the late yes. life. Yes. Ah, neuro progression, and ultimately there is a chance of various neuro degeneration disorder. And we certainly don't know most of the neuro degeneration disorder. Ah, हम लोग तो अभी dementia बोल रहे हैं. Actual neuro degeneration disorder के बारे में हम लोगों को पता ही नहीं. There are thousands of neuro degeneration disorders. we are just getting to know them now for example in 2021 uh, they have created a new form of dementia late dementia so bhaskar what is the what is the practical implication of this knowledge that everything is linked on a spectrum ab ye ho jaye na so we can number 1 we can finally answer us One of our biggest shortcoming. हम लोगों को लोग क्या बोलते हैं ये तो सबे में सब कुछ देते हैं एक साइकोसिस में भी एंटी डिप्रेशन दे दिया डिप्रेशन में भी एंटी डिप्रेशन दे दिया एंजाइटी में भी दे दिया तो फिर इनका स्पेसिफिक ड्रग क्या है बोलते हैं ना नाउ इफ वी अंडरस्टैंड दिस थिंग वी वुड बी एबल टू से नो वी आर गिविंग इट बिकॉज एट इट्स रूट it is a common dysfunction of a huge system which is controlling whole body so our drugs work at specific checkpoints of this system so each drug can be given in various symptom depending on what are the presenting symptom this is number one knowledge that would give us self confidence number two we would be finally be able to shake the shackles in the name of anti psychotic anti depressant anti obsessive and mood stabilizer because we understand that those doesn't exist those terms doesn't exist every drug can be used in a phenomena depending on what and how 
it is formed and we need not be so dogmatic about using these antipsychotic only in psychosis or antidepressants only in depression number 3 and possibly the biggest advantage is now we can see every non communicable disease are arising as a seed from these homeostatic disturbances if that is that true then our drugs are not only psychotropics our drugs are drugs which have immunomodulatory role which have role in each of these non communicable diseases in various form and so our drugs becomes major drugs not unnecessary drugs or drugs which are to be stopped in a patient whenever that patient develops some destabilization which has long been tradition of psychiatry कोई भी काम हो रहा है हमारे ड्रग बंद कर दो सो सो हाउ मच हाउ मच हेल्प विल इट गिव इन हाइपर टेंशन और प्रिवेंशन ऑफ कैंसर मतलब इज इट अ बिग इफेक्ट प्रिवेंशन ऑफ कैंसर देयर इज एक्चुअली सम डाटा आई हैव सेंट यू द पेपर बिफोर बट आई रिमेंबर द डाटा टिल नाउ राफली 15 to 20 percent reductions. Sir, 15 to 20 percent reduction in solid tissue tumor. This is a two population based study. Means millions of people were recruited, and their conclusion is 15 to 20 percent reduction in solid tissue tumor. There is no data collected. in hematological malignancy or various other malignancy number 2 in various inflammatory malignancy means glioblastoma multiforme or inflammatory carcinoma of breast uh, there is high percentage of response to various psychotropics but again here we don't have any uh, uh, um, clear percentage noted in other areas the data is not so clear in hypertension in difficult to uh, the, they have created two designation for hypertension difficult to treat hypertension treatment refractory hypertension difficult to treat hypertension is where three drug combination is needed refractory is where five drug or more is needed now in these both cases there are some promising antidepressant trial but at present no data in my personal practice i and various medicine colleagues have used adequate dose of antidepressants in these people and some more time than not we have got response that number of antihypertensive could be reduced well can it be replicated in other people that needs to be seen because single person observation has no value in science my myself is the easiest person to be deceived by me so we need replication number 3 is diabetes now diabetes in diabetes there is actually study in diabetes there are studies emerging where two things are getting clear number one the newer anti diabetic drug they are antidepressants anti anxiety and they have prominent cerebral action and our drugs do have anti diabetic action in diabetes it is getting some actually concrete base in other non communicable diseases we are yet to find uh, post cancer survival is increased with our drugs but again the data is sparse interstitial lung disease and various autoimmune diseases of lung in these cases antidepressants have worked good 
now in infectious diseases there is role of antidepressants in various chemotherapy regime there is role of various antipsychotics but again these are just tip of iceberg we need to go long before we can get something and always we have to remember whatever i am saying today is so far theoretically tested by many but practically tested by only me unless, unless more people actually try this and find this we cannot say the last word amrit same i think we need to call bhaskar another time or you want to hear him uh, everything in this session so maine isliye jag sach nahi bola because the thing is uh, this is such a important area ke jag agar bolunga to ye jali ke ho jaye ek sare ka bola na bhaskar we'll call you another time ha we'll call you another bolenge i think that we bolenge am the chair persons my my boss Uh, I, I think the last uh, one hour plus was such informative, uh, heavily loaded discussion. So much of neurobiology, it, it's quite hard for somebody who's actually not uh, in uh, in tune with the neurological discussions to understand. Actually, I found it so difficult to concentrate and keep listening. I will have a lot of doubts, but I think uh, probably this session was uh, for the larger audience, and a lot of people have benefited from uh, discussion the last one hour plus. Uh, there are a lot of questions still remaining, a lot of unanswered uh, issues also. But uh, as Amrit was suggesting, I think we're going to have another excellent session by uh, Dr. Basker. Uh, I thank Dr. Basker for uh, you know anchoring the last one hour plus, and it was excellent. Thank you, Basker. Hey, sir. Hmm. Sir, Rani, sir. Hey, sir. Hello. Let Hello, Radhanishak. Please speak. Any sir? I have strained my head a lot, and my brain is now almost fatty uh, because of the details Baskar has served to us, and I will go through them again through the slides. Okay, I had a question, but I will ask him personally on in another forum. Thank you. Sufyan sir, thank you, Hexer Baskar, again for your informative and highly. In enlightening presentation as i personally take it i believe in molecular biological aspect of any science but for me it was still let me admit it was a little confusing and there will be a lot of questions to clarify the confusions so i will request faskar for two things amrit and dilip to coordinate that we have two more sessions and we have but legs for these two presentations by faskar we can specifically send the links again and everyone should go through it and put the note of the questions which you can send to dr vaskar so that he comes prepared with those answers only hmm. for the overloading and then we can have another session on the clinical implications because many things came to my mind and many other people over here hmm. that what is its utility unless you utilize has a clinical implication which at last vaskar the dr vaskar verified that i understand this, this i have and made you understand this i think but i am only using it so we must be enlightened enough that we can use it and see its real implication in clinical psychiatry two more sessions faster if it does not disturb you okay i am ready thank you thank you thank you everybody thanks all thank you so so i have to give Now, the office Now go to Amrit. Bhaskar, as always, gives you stress as long as he does not log in. Ali and me. Sir, Bhaskar, I am not. Don't ask. Don't. अरे क्या आज की आज क्या करके आया इसे मालूम है? Sir, Bhaskar will come. He is forgotten. He pick his phone. So Bhaskar was three minutes or four minutes late or five minutes late. But then he and once he comes, then you know he takes up all your attention. He. Takes all questions. He answers all questions. He puts questions. He questions himself. So brilliant boy, brilliant friend. And what? <laughs> Amrit Bodhani was speaking. We all, you know, 
agree to it doctor bata nahi wo hai packing over telephone told that i have got many questions to ask i told that is why you need to hear sarachi bodi joke in bimbal dance it was nice seeing you after such a long time and you know it was pleasure hearing to you thank you all for coming i would specially congratulate dr alim because you fit in bhaskar in this platform that was a tough 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 call you know a lot of discussion i go about congratulations darpan darpan ko bolne do hat kar to torrent thank you dr darpan unmute and tell and darpan is already dressed as a professor he she wants everybody to clap her becoming a professor <laughs> <laughs> Darpan wanted to tell something. You can unmute. So look, till then, good night. You can unmute. You can discuss. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Doctor Amrit, for your kind wishes. Thank you, Topan Sir.